Great. Welcome to Forward Together, where science, ethics, and religion intersect in a changing world. This is the breakout session on climate and environment. My name is Emily Therese Cloyd, and I am the director of AAAS's Center on Public Engagement. I'm also a climate scientist, and I lead AAAS's How We Respond project on how communities across the United States are responding to climate change. And I'll be the moderator for this session. Through this virtual platform, we're able to gather from all over the country and world. And I would like to gratefully acknowledge all of the diverse and vibrant indigenous peoples on whose ancestral homelands many of us stand. I'm joining you today from Southwest Washington, DC, which is the ancestral homeland of the indigenous Piscataway and Anacostan people. For those in North America, I encourage you to visit native-land period CA as a starting point to see what indigenous communities call your region home and to learn more about them. Before we get started, also a reminder that closed captioning is available for this session. You can click on the live captioning button at the bottom of your screen to turn the captions on and off and to adjust the settings. There will be some time for questions from the audience during this session, and I invite you to use uh, the Q&A button to enter your questions throughout the session. You can also upvote others' questions through that uh, window. And a reminder that this session is being recorded. So let's go ahead and get started. In the United States, religious communities are working closely with scientists, civic leaders, and policymakers to address the causes and effects of climate change. In this session, we'll have a conversation about current climate science research and how elements of, of various faith traditions combined with cutting edge science can provide resources and tools for communities as they respond. Our panelists for this session are Ms. Nana Furman, Senior Ambassador at Green Faith, and Dr. Marshall Shepard, the Georgia Athletic Association Distinguished Professor of Geography and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Georgia and Director of its Atmospheric Sciences Program. Ms. Furman and Dr. Shepard have given me permission to use our first names during this conversation. I'm going to give each of them a few minutes to, to talk a little bit more about who they are and what they do before we begin our discussion. Nana, we'll start with you. Thank you. Thank you so much again for Triple uh, AS for inviting me to be part of this important dialogue. First, uh, before I... Uh, Oh, thank you again, uh, AAAS, for inviting me to be part of this important dialogue. And first, uh, before I begin, I'd like to greet everyone uh, with peace from my Islamic tradition. Assalamu alaikum. And I'm calling from Riverside, California, a tribal land for uh, Kahuya Nation. So a little bit about me. I was born in Jambi, which is a rainforest region in central uh, Sumatra Island but raised in Jakarta, the capital city of Indonesia, from a Muslim family. And throughout my youth, I took nature for granted because everything, like if you live in the tropics, everything that you can just throw a seed and then it's going to grow fruit trees. So I never really thought about, you know, like that you have to uh, save nature protect nature because i thought everything is just um, as it is until i was in college uh, i went to college in the united states uh, i think like in my undergraduate i was um, you know like in my, one of my speech class i was asked to do like persuasive uh, speech and i took the the issue on the uh, deforestation in the amazon forest and i was very shocked at my young age that to find out that uh, the deforestation of the Amazon, and I, because I I um, uh, I know that I was born from the rainforest area, and if that's what they did for the rainforest, what about the rainforest in my where I'm from? So that's I think like my first opening about the relationship between myself as an individual with with nature in terms of consciousness. And, um, you know, just to uh, fast forward after I returned back, after I did my uh, my education in the US, I returned back to Indonesia. And uh, in the end of 2004, the, the big earthquake and tsunami 
uh, happened and I was called upon to help out by the World Wildlife Fund for Nature to uh, to do the relief efforts and also like to uh, to to do the study on uh, what is the uh, the future um, uh, uh, program and as well as like to ensure that the reconstruction and the rehabilitation that is that was going to be done was was done in the sustainable way. So so I had like you know I I lead the program. Uh, it's called green reconstruction, and uh, to ensure that. And one of the pro the project was to regreening the coastal area because the coastal area was damaged. So what the program was about planting, uh, the mangrove at that time, and somehow I was using like all the like you know like scientific uh, like language and also like uh, conservation language like conservation sustainability uh, environmental health, but somehow the the community didn't understand me. And it was devastated for me. I was so frustrated because how could they not understanding? This is uh, very important to maintain the, the sustainability of the damaged area. So then a friend of mine, um, uh, you know, in the midst of my frustration, a friend of mine um, suggested why not, uh, you know, like uh, using the Islamic teaching in, in communicating my, uh, you know, my message because the people in that region is a very devout Muslim. Up to that point, I've never seen the connection. Like, you know, I, I'm practicing Muslim and I also like care about the, the environment, but I didn't put one and one together until that time. I looked back to the teaching, uh, the, the Islamic teaching, to the, the holy book, the Quran, and also the prophetic uh, tradition. And I found a lot of environmental uh, protection and messages. So one of the particular um, prophetic saying that I, I took on is uh, if the day of uh, resurrection is about to establish tomorrow and one of you holding a sapling or a seedling, then you have to plant it. So I, I thought this is very powerful. So I actually convey that message to the, to the community and the response amazingly changed completely. They said that they wanted to do the planting now the, on the greening the coastal area because it's part of their faith tradition. And at that point, I realized that we need to uh, co use the communication on the, the, the religious tradition, faith tradition, spirituality on our communication towards you know like trying to protect the environment and also like maintaining the environmental balance so and i i think I, in my life journey that coastal mangrove forest is a manifestation of my spiritual growth through a relationship with nature so i think that's just uh, my a little bit about myself uh, as an introduction thank you thank you and marshall could i ask you to introduce yourself a bit please Sure, thank you. I'm Marshall Shepard, and it's an honor for me to be participating here today uh, uh, with this event. I, I applaud AAAS for this panel and for the opportunity to talk about the sort of what some people see as a collision between science and faith and religion, whereas I see it as an opportunity between science, religion, and faith. Uh, I grew up in a small town uh, north of Atlanta, suburban Atlanta now, but at the time that I grew up, it was a very rural community in Georgia. Uh, I always loved science. I mean, that was always something that trickled through me. Uh, quiet as kept, I was not always interested in being a, an atmospheric scientist or a, a climate scientist, which I am now. Uh, I was very much interested in insects. I wanted to be a an entomologist. So I used to catch insects in the yard, catch honeybees and things, and I got stung by one and found out I was allergic to bee stings. And at that point, I shifted my science project the next year to weather, built weather instruments from things around the house. 
that's how I became interested in meteorology. And so went on to become a meteorologist, get my PhD in meteorology, worked for NASA for 12 years before joining the faculty at the University of Georgia as the director of its atmospheric sciences program. Uh, I've served a stint as the president of the American Meteorological Society and have had the honor to receive some pretty significant uh, honors and awards in my career as a climate scientist, which I'm grateful and blessed to receive. From a faith perspective, I, I grew up in a fairly traditional Christian Black Southern church. And I hated to go. You know, I, I think one of the things that we, we when we talk about some of these things, you know, I, I like to kind of keep it real. And so as a, as a kid, I, I just dreadfully hated when my mom, mom would make me go to church. Um, I didn't really understand sort of what it was about. I just felt like we were sitting there for two and three hours listening to a bunch of songs and all of these formalities and so forth. Uh, later in life, you know, you know, I developed a stronger relationship with my faith and so forth. But it was an interesting journey because when I tell people that I'm a climate scientist and I certainly understand the data that suggests that climate is changing and that it's real and humans are contributing to it or perhaps even causing most of it now, you know, you know, I, I would still get pushback from people that say, how can you call yourself a faith or a Christian or this and that and you believe in climate change? And I'll say, well, first of all, Climate change isn't a belief system. My son believes in the tooth theory, or he used to. Uh, you know, I don't believe the sun's going to come up tomorrow. I certainly have a pretty good scientific evidence that it will. And so, you know, we we have to remove this sort of notion of climate change as a belief system. Um, but people would ask me, well, how can you sort of reconcile that? That's blasphemous to think that human beings can contribute uh, to. Uh, changing the weather or changing our climate. And I said, it's not. I said, if you go back and look at any holy book, whether you're talking about the Quran or the Bible or any, there, there are certainly statements about stewardship of our planet or stewardship of our earth or where we live. And so there's nothing at all inconsistent about any scriptural text and our understanding of the science. And so yeah, I really appreciate this opportunity uh, to delve into that a bit because it's just one more opportunity to shatter this notion or this myth that people that are of science can't be people of faith. Uh, I will conclude, I'm, I'm very active on Twitter, so I would invite any of the panelists to follow me at Dr. Shepard 2013 on Twitter and feel free to share things that I'm saying today. Uh, it's at DR, not doctor just spelled out, but DR, because I think it's important that we take information like this out of these Zoom panels and out of these committees and, com and conferences to the broader reach that we all have. So thanks again for the invitation. Well, thank you again both for joining us. Uh, I'd like to start with a question for Nana. Um, thank you for sharing the work that you have done in Acha at the beginning of your career. How has that work informed what you've done since? You've organized uh, things like the Islamic Declaration on Climate Change and the Global Muslim Climate Network. How does this all tie together? Yeah, so uh, after that, I becoming like, not obsessed, but I guess like passionate because I never put the, the connection uh, before, even though like growing up, my parents always uh, told me like, you know, about uh, you know, caring for uh, for the the plants and you know, like for the animals, but I just never like put it like you know in in a true connection uh, until that moment. Uh, you know, like kind of like uh, opening, like you know, kind of woke me up. So after that, I I work a lot with uh, religious leaders, like uh, different religious leaders, uh, trying to. Uh, uh, include them on this conversation. Like uh, uh, Dr. Shepard said that, you know, like often like there is the, this gap between science and, and faith. And um, many of the scriptures talk about be, you know, taking care of the, the nature, yet we have like this like gap that, you know, like somehow we are speaking different languages. So then, you know, like I, I tried to, to bridge the gap on that, and uh, in many, uh, in some of my work on the climate uh, as well, uh, and um, so I include the religious leaders and try to engage them to 
to explore what is the teaching from the you know like from the islamic faith from christian from buddhism from hinduism so like then they find uh, their own voices from that. And then when I moved to the, the US like uh, nine, 10 years ago, um, I joined Green Faith. Uh, I began as a fellows in Green Faith where I met with so many uh, faith leaders that is uh, having the same kind of inclination, like passion with me. So I feel like I'm, I'm, I have my, you know, like my community on that and I've been working uh, uh, on that ever since. So I work uh, pre, uh, like, you know, like fo and focus with the Muslim uh, leaders and communities, but also like in the multi-faith uh, settings where I work with different faith communities. And, you know, like uh, all faiths, like, you know, mess, like have the same message as a steward upon this earth. And how can we bring this, you know, on the table? So that's why I really appreciate this, this event, because then, you know, we need to sit together with the science because the science is real. That's the fact. That's the science. And uh, how can we communicate this also with our faith, uh, you know, like faith communities through our faith leaders? For Marshall, thank you for sharing a bit about your own faith background. One of the things that I saw you've worked on recently is a climate action plan with the Catholic Archdiocese of Atlanta. How did you come to be involved in that project? Can you tell us a bit more? Sure. It was around the time that the Pope was really uh, talking about efforts to engage the, the Catholic Church. And by the way, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not Catholic, but uh, I was very much engaged in that effort. I was very aware of what was going on. Uh, around that time, a colleague at my university, Susan Varlamov, actually, who's someone that's very in, active in our own right and someone that I, you know, appreciate her mentorship in some of these sort of faith climate intersection related issues. Uh, she was approached uh, by by that group and, you know, queried some professors at the University of Georgia and there were there were several of us that were willing to engage and so we helped uh, with that request and and now that that document is available uh, through the Archdiocese here in Atlanta uh, it's very uh, much aligned with the, the encyclical and some of the other sort of documents that have emerged from the Catholic Church and so it, it was just one more way for me uh, to sort of help break down this sort of perceived barrier or wall uh, between faith or religious based activities and those activities around science. I, I, I think that's something that's very important. Uh, over the last several years, people have asked me about my optimism about climate change or perhaps pessimism about it as we were the United States withdrew from the Paris Agreement, for example, or other things. Thankfully, we're back in now. And I said, I'm optimistic because although those things have been going on, uh, you're seeing so much engagement and activity in the local, local and, and regional uh, organizations, private companies, and the, but I also specifically mentioned faith-based communities. If you look all around the world, uh, faith-based communities are now some of the leaders in, in sort of efforts of engagement and education around environmental and climate issues. A shout out to uh, our mutual good friend, uh, Reverend Kate McGregor Mosley, and uh, she, who at least here in Georgia was part of the Georgia Interfaith Power and Light. And there's a larger Interfaith Power and Light uh, that ha in, the, in the United States. So uh, that's something that has been of a point of optimism for me as we move forward. Yeah. Um, so for, for uh, Nana, what opportunities or challenges do you see for religious communities as they're engaging with the scientific community on climate change? We just heard from uh, Marshall about how um, faith communities are often leaders in this space. Yeah, so uh, in terms of like the faith community, sometimes people uh, forget that there is a few research uh, that in the world, like the uh, like 84% of the world population consider themselves as people of faith. And yet, I think like we haven't really explored this opportunity in terms of uh, like the climate crisis uh, issue. 
So, but like, you know, like in the last 15 years or so, I think like we've seen the changing on that because more and more like faith communities, uh, like focusing on education and uh, awareness raising on uh, the ecological deg uh, degradation, the climate change issue, and teaching that um, that our faiths and uh, the central teachings uh, apply not only between people and the sacred, because like most uh, uh, faith see that this earth as sacred, nature is sacred, and so not just like people to the sacred, but also person to the planet. And then, uh, and then, even the the education is vital, but it's not just enough because then, the magnitude of of the crisis is so huge, and and we need to also engage them into action. So, like for example, what um, what we are trying to bring is to bring this uh, into life as like either like um, seeing at the houses of worship, like you know like greening the houses of worship is very uh, becoming more popular, like greening the mosque, greening the church, greening the temple and so on. And also uh, the uh, religious communities started to see how they practice their own uh, traditions. Like, so they, they are trying to greening their own practices as well. So for me as a Muslim, um, we have the, 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 the holy month of Ramadan where we fast every month and we started to greening the greening ramadan campaign i think it's the last 10 years like you know it's uh, it's also like going global now so in the beginning of course it's very hard to like put people on you know kind of there's a challenge because they said like uh, what are you trying to do here <laughs> but then like we see the practice it's like you know like oh you're creating a lot of ways when you break your fast and this is the holy month we're not supposed to produce ways but we're supposed to like, you know, like kind of like, you know, spiritual uh, like um, development. So from that, the people started to see, oh yes, like, you know, like the, how come like we're practicing uh, our faith, but then like we're also damaging the earth at the same time. So they kind of like, you know, like a wake up call also the, then there is a change on that. And also like, um, so like, and the uh, the greening of the, the house of worship, for example, it took a while for me, like uh, I uh, I lived in San Diego before, so I gave the talk to uh, to the mosque, like the imam, uh, fortunately very supportive of my message. Uh, so he's always gi giving me a platform to talk to the community, explaining about the science of, uh, of the uh, climate change, and as well as like what is the, from the, the, the Islamic teaching and what should we do as people of faith. And after like three years or so, like talking and keep talking to the community, I think the board of the mosque decided to hear me. <laughs> and they said that we're going to put a solar panel in our mosque. So that that is a big clip because before it's like, oh, what are you talking about? Science, science of the climate in the mosque, like this is not a science, like, you know, like a science uh, presentation, but then, you know, because I, put it in the, also from the faith uh, uh, perspective, and also I have the support from the Imam, then, you know, like, it's kind of like making, you know, my challenge, like, easier a little bit, uh, because I have the support. So then I think like that's, that's like some challenges uh, in the beginning. But now I think like a lot of like, uh, faith communities see this as, you know, it's real, because we see it, we see the the damage from the, the the impact of climate crisis is there. We see it every day in in the news. So like you know, like you, I I say to people like you can't like you know if you don't believe in climate change, that's fine. But you know, like the fact is here, and whether we do something about it or not, and then as people of faith, we are called to help and you know to do whatever and however we could for uh, so so they're not. We don't have like uh, people suffering because of that. So that's you know that's how I, I you know like I overcome my challenge. Uh, so Marshall, you've interacted with a number of different faith communities as you have um, been talking about climate change, doing your work and your research. 
what advice might you give to your colleagues in meteorology and climate science if they would like to engage with faith communities? Oh, you're muted. Uh, the the words of uh, the pandemic era, you're muted. <laughs> it's a really interesting question um, because you know some of my colleagues will never interact with those faith-based communities because they may have their own personal reasons not to. But for those that want to engage, uh, I would say there are a couple of things that I always keep in mind. One, trying to connect with a common value system. And Dr. Catherine Hayhoe often talks about this, and I've often subscribed to that same philosophy, no matter what group I'm going to talk to, whether it's a faith-based group or a group of skeptics on climate change or policymakers. Uh, typically, when you find a common value system or a common sort of thread of uh, that you can anchor to, uh, that allows you to sort of move forward, uh, lessen any mistrust that may be there. Uh, that's important. Establish that common value system. Establish um, a mutual uh, co-production and co-sharing of knowledge. What I mean by that is oftentimes those of us in the ivory tower or us academics can come into these settings, whether it's a church or a faith-based organization or community group, and say, hey, here I am, Mr. or Mrs. Big PhD with all my studies and graphs and trend lines and letters after my name. Here's what the problem is. Here's what I think you should do. Here's why, how you, uh, you know, that's just not the way to sort of co-produce and co-share knowledge. Uh, you have to engage with these communities uh, on, a, on, an, on an even playing field, on level ground, and from a shared and common value system. And then you can start to, you know, lessen mistrust and develop solutions in a, in a, together. I, I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that sort of the academic or an ivory tower crowd makes, beyond also just talking in a lot of scientific jargon to groups of people that don't speak our language. I mean, it's fine to talk like that in, at our professional science conferences or perhaps in our classrooms, but when I go to a church or when I go to a faith-based group and talk about climate-related issues, you know, I, I, I talk about it with a very different perspective than perhaps I would if I were at the American Geophysical Union Conference or the American Meteorological Society, and I think that's something else that I would sort of share with my colleagues uh, in the academic and ivory tower space. You got to develop dexterity and flexibility in your messaging. Uh, I mean, I, we, we are learned scholars. And one of the things that we've been taught to do as scientists in our graduate programs and our dissertations is to dig deep and probe uh, and develop expertise and then write 300 pages about it. And at the end of the 300 pages, tell you what we found. You've got to completely invert that. And I think AAAS has talked about that in some of its science communication. You've got to completely invert that and tell people, get right to the point of what your messaging is and why it matters to them. Save, save all the background and details to, for our dissertations or for our one hour or two hour long lectures at conferences. So building on that, and uh, this can be a question for both of you. Um, you talked about finding overlaps in values and um, an ethics as sort of a starting point for conversation. Can you talk a little bit more about what some of those shared values or shared ethical considerations might be as we think about climate change? Well, I'll, I'll defer to Nana first. Yes, yeah, so uh, I think that uh, like more and more, the I mean, I've been working in the climate uh issues for some times and more and more i see that the climate climate crisis or environmental degradation is is a spiritual and moral and ethical issue uh like if we present it that way because like you know like for example like when i talk to people i i you know i share this that everyone no matter what creed they are what faith they are or no faith they want like you know to breathe fresh air, drink clean water, eat healthy food, have better future for the children. So those are the, the, you know, like the, the, like, you know, the values and the inclination that everyone wants it. But then like, you know, like when we see like what we're like, you know, like what happened around us is all the pollution, the, you know, like disaster happened. So then, you know, we need to do something together and 
and the earth is speaking to us nature speaks to us that we, we don't really take care of nature uh that that and as uh, people of faith we are um you know like uh asked to do so then you know like so so what i see that you know like the the faith uh communities has a crucial role to 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 play in this and especially also like when we bring the justice issue like the eco justice or the climate justice movement then that's even like more like you know for them to to like kind of uh uh plug in on this and then uh and then because the faith also have the power to transform consciousness and shape values and and you know having their ritual to have like you know more resilience and also to motivate uh, communities to take action to change their lifestyle for example or like even their insti like uh, religious institution so it's it's there is a power on that that we need to explore and also to celebrate and how can we work together like between faith and science uh communities together so then we can collaborate even stronger because i'm i'm like i have this simple word that uh about this moral issue um i see that uh science is uh explain the how but yet faith explain the why so we need both we need we need people to have the why why they do this and how can we do it uh, in the better way? So that's how I see it. Uh, and I would I would just add to that. I, I I can't really sort of add anything different to what Nana said there because I think she covered it very well. I mean, it 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 really is a no brainer. When I mean, we breathe the same air, uh, we drink the same water. You know, no matter what faith we claim or uh, adhere to. Uh, we have one planet. We don't have a plan B planet. And so uh, we have a common and shared interest in thinking carefully about how we sort of treat our planet and, and how we consume the science that will help this planet. I mean, as, I think as we've seen, for example, with COVID-19, um, one of the biggest challenges our society has faced, you know, science and technology and a lot of prayer and faith have helped us kind of hopefully start to get on the other side of it. We certainly aren't there by any means if you look at what's happening worldwide and in certain places, but I'd, I'd hazard to say at least where, from the, where I'm sitting, it's better now than it was a year ago. And so I think there are some lessons that we can learn from the experience with COVID uh, that very much apply when we, talk, when we think about climate change. Uh, I think the color, I, I, that's why I really appreciate organizations like Interfaith Power and Light uh, because the collective and shared sort of resources, intellect, and prayer from various faith groups, you know, it doesn't you know really matter specifically what faith we are. Uh, the collective resources and, and might of the, such organizations uh, can help move the needle. And that's what we need. We need needle movers in society, no matter what they look like, what color they are, who they worship, why they worship, who they love, and so forth. We just need needle movers. And so uh, I, I think that that shared collective, I mean, we, we have, if, if as divided as we are on many things on this planet, there's one thing that no one can ever argue that we're divided on. And that's the fact that we share the planet Earth. Thank you. And just for all of our uh, participants, I do remind you, you can use that Q&A box to ask questions for our panelists. Um, and if you're not sure what you want to ask, you can take a look in there and upvote questions as well. Um, but I'd like to build on a point that Marshall just brought up, which is um, wanting to see different, different people who are the needle movers. Um, and you've talked before about wanting to redefine what people think about when they think of a scientist. So why is that important? And how are you helping to redefine what a scientist is? Yeah, I appreciate that question because it's one that I get all, I mean, there, you know, there's just these stereotypes that I think, you know, propagated from our youth about what scientists look like, how they dress. I mean, you know, the lab coats and just, frankly, because there's some underrepresentation, not many scientists that are of color or perhaps women and so forth. So there are these sort of, 
sort of stereotypes about what scientists look like. And then there's some real challenges in, in who scientists are because of just historical underrepresentation and access over the last 50 years or so. I mean, for example, in my field, I'm, again, I mentioned earlier, I was president of the American Meteorological Society. And so I've seen the data, only 2% of the American Meteorological Society's membership, the largest professional society for weather and climate scientists in the U.S. are African-American, less than 1% for Native American, uh, 1% to 2% for Hispanic and so forth. So, you know, there are sort of different sort of shades of sort of what people think scientists are from sort of these different lenses that they've often seen science scientists. But then there's sort of the sort of, sort of rut that I think scientists and academics themselves stick themselves in, in terms of their ability to not convey oftentimes, many of them, uh, information beyond their peer groups or their, their expertise groups uh, and their lack of willingness because they're afraid to be called popularizers if they speak to the media or go talk to the uh, president or policymakers. You know, there are a lot of ivory tower hangups that I don't subscribe to. Um, you know, I've even told someone, I had someone tell me, wow, you don't even dress like a scientist because your tie is really nice and your suit. Um, what does that mean? I mean, I, I like suits and I like, I know how to pick out a tie. I mean, I mean, there's no sort of sort of preconceived sort of representation of what a scientist looks like. And so, you know, as I've shared, I mean, I'm very adamant about, I mean, I, I was, I, I was blessed and honored to be elected to the National Academy of Sciences this year, a huge honor for my career. Um, I suspect I'm probably one of the youngest people to be elected to that, that prestigious group. And there are probably some other things, at, attributes that, that I bring to the table in, in, as well. And, and I say that only to say, that's part of my mission. I mean, I, you know, I, I was recognized for my scientific scholarship there, but beyond those sort of ivory tower academic metrics, I just want people to understand that I, I bleed just like you do. I love my kids just like you do if you have them. And I want the best for my planet, no matter what degrees I have or how I think about the world. So we're rapidly running out of time. I think this might be our last question. Um, and so we'll start, I think we'll first go to Nana with this. Um, what roles do you think faith and science together particularly play in providing inspiration and hope when we're facing this very scary uh, prospect of climate change? Well, thank you. And uh, I think like the, like if you talk to religious leaders, they're like in the business of providing hope. <laughs> so like, <laughs> So, and, and also like there's no religions uh, actually sanction the destruction of this planet. So then, so that's, but when we see, we, that's what we are doing at the moment. So then, whereas like our religious and spiritual beliefs compel us to respond to them. And uh, like uh, Dr. Shepard said, like, you know, like it doesn't matter who you are, we all want the same thing and we bleed, uh, you know, the same blood. <laughs> So um, just like, and to change everything, we it takes everyone. So then Green Faith just uh, recently launched a global campaign, Sacred People, Sacred Earth, where we want everyone to come together. And we also put the uh, 10 demands to the government and financial institution and hold them accountable to take seriously how we can, you know, like, uh, uh, solve this problem together and and of course like we we're welcome you know like work with the scientists uh you know like to provide more data because that's always good to have data uh, on our you know like any campaign or our uh, engagement uh with with our uh, faith communities and of course together we can make the change and the time to act is now I don't, <laughs> that was the perfect ending point. So I really don't want to add anything to that except to say what she said. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much to our panelists, uh, to uh, Nana Furman and to Dr. Marshall Shepard. And thank you to all of you for joining us for the stimulating conversation. Um, we have to say goodbye to you for this panel, but to join the next session, you just have to go back to dozer.events and click on the button next to uh, the next session that you would like to attend. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Seifert. Thank you, Nana. Great to be a part of this with you. Yes.